In the early 2000s, it seemed that cosmologists had solved the largest and most complex puzzle of all, how the universe works. All the ways of studying the universe, mapping galaxies and their larger structures, catching catastrophic stellar explosions called supernovas, calculating distance to variable stars, measuring the residual cosmic glow from the early universe, told stories that seemed to overlap. The glue that held the stories together had been discovered a few years earlier, in 1998. Dark energy, a mysterious force that, rather than gluing the cosmos together, is somehow causing it to expand ever more speedily instead of slowing down over time. When scientists included this cosmic something in their models of the universe, theories and observations meshed. They drafted what is now known as the standard model of cosmology, called Lambda CDM, in which dark energy makes up nearly 70% of the universe, while another mysterious dark entity, a type of invisible mass that seems to interact with normal matter only through gravity, makes up about 25%. The remaining 5% is everything we can see. The stars, planets, and galaxies that astronomers have studied for millennia. But that moment of tranquility was only a brief respite between times of struggle. As astronomers made more precise observations of the universe across the sweep of cosmic time with increasingly advanced telescopes like James Webb, cracks began to appear in the standard model. Some of the first signs of trouble came from measurements of variable stars and supernovas in a handful of nearby galaxies. Observations that, when compared with the residual cosmic glow, suggested that our universe plays by different rules than we thought, and that a crucial cosmological parameter that defines how fast the universe is flying apart changes when you measure it with different yardsticks. Cosmologists had a problem, something they called a tension or in their more dramatic moments, a crisis. Those discordant measurements have only become more distinct in the decade or so since the first cracks emerged. And this discrepancy isn't the only challenge to cosmology's standard model. Observations of galaxies suggest that the way in which cosmic structures have clumped together over time may differ from our best understanding of how today's universe should have grown from seeds embedded in the early cosmos. And even more subtle mismatches come from detailed studies of the universe's earliest light. Other inconsistencies abound. As Eleonora D. Valentino, a theoretical cosmologist at the University of Sheffield, said, There are many more smaller problems elsewhere. This is why it's puzzling. Because it's not just these big problems. To alleviate these tensions, cosmologists are taking two complementary approaches. First, they're continuing to make more precise observations of the cosmos in the hope that better data will reveal clues as to how to proceed. In addition, they are finding ways to subtly tweak the standard model to accommodate the unexpected results. But these solutions are often contrived, and if they solve one problem, they often make others worse. Put simply, our cosmology right now seems like a big mess, and we just don't know what to make of it. To characterize our universe, scientists use a handful of numbers, which cosmologists call parameters. The physical entities that these values refer to are all gears in a giant cosmic machine, with each bit connected to the others. One of those parameters relates to the present-day expansion rate of the universe, known as the Hubble constant. A dozen years ago, scientists saw the first hints of trouble with measurements of how fast the universe is expanding today. But it took years to accumulate enough data to convince most cosmologists that they were dealing with a full-on crisis. To brief, measurements of how fast the universe is expanding today don't match the value you get when extrapolating from the early universe. The conundrum has become known as the Hubble tension. To calculate the Hubble constant, Astronomers need to know how far away things are. In the nearby cosmos, scientists measure distances using stars called C-feed variables that periodically change in brightness. There's a well-known relationship between how fast one of these stars swings from brightest to faintest and how much energy it radiates. That relation, 
which was discovered in the early 20th century, allows astronomers to calculate the star's intrinsic brightness. And by comparing that to how bright it appears, they can calculate its distance. Using these variable stars, scientists can measure the distances to galaxies up to about 100 million light years from us. But to see a bit farther away and a bit further back in time, they use a brighter mile marker, a specific type of stellar explosion called a type EA supernova. Astronomers can also calculate the intrinsic brightness of these standard candles, which allows them to measure distances to galaxies billions of light years away. Over the past two decades, these observations have helped astronomers pin a value on how fast the nearby universe is expanding, roughly 73 kilometers per second per megaparsec, which means that as you look further away, for each megaparsec or 3.26 million light years of distance, space is flying away, 73 kilometers per second faster. But that value clashes with one derived from another ruler embedded in the infant universe. In the very beginning, the universe was searing plasma, a soup of fundamental particles and energy. It was a hot mess, said Vivian poulain Tolle, a cosmologist at the University of Montpellier. A fraction of a second into cosmic history, some occurrence, perhaps a period of extreme acceleration known as Inflation sent jolts, pressure waves, through the murky plasma. Then, as the universe cooled, light that was trapped in the elemental plasma fog finally broke free. That light, the cosmic microwave background, or CMB, reveals those early pressure waves just as the surface of a frozen lake holds on to the overlapping crests of waves frozen in time. Cosmologists have measured the most common wavelength of those frozen pressure waves and used it to calculate a value for the Hubble constant of 60,000.6 km per second per megaparsec, with an uncertainty of less than 1%. The peculiarly discordant values, roughly 67 versus 73, have ignited a fiery debate in cosmology that is still unresolved and the new round of measurements from the James Webb Space Telescope seems to re-cemented this tension as a very real problem to overcome. Sharp infrared vision is one of James Webb's superpowers. With its large mirror and sensitive optics, it can readily separate the Cepheid light from neighboring stars with little blending. In the first year of Webb operations with our General Observers Program 1685, we collected observations of Cepheids found by Hubble at two steps along what's known as the Cosmic Distance Ladder. The first step involves observing Cepheids in a galaxy with a known geometric distance that allows us to calibrate the true luminosity of Cepheids. For our program, that galaxy is NGC4258. The second step is to observe Cepheids in the host galaxies of recent Type 1 a supernovae. The combination of the first two steps transfers knowledge of the distance to the supernovae to calibrate their true luminosities. Step three is to observe those supernovae far away, where the expansion of the universe is apparent and can be measured by comparing the distances inferred from their brightness and the redshifts of the supernova host galaxies. This sequence of steps is known as the distance ladder. And in recent weeks, Scientists finally got our first web measurements from steps one and two, which allowed us to complete the distance ladder and compare to the previous measurements with Hubble. Webb's measurements have dramatically cut the noise in the Cepheid measurements due to the observatory's resolution at near-infrared wavelengths. This kind of improvement is the stuff astronomers dream of. James Webb observed a total of more than 320 Cepheids across the first two steps, then, the telescope has pretty much confirmed that Hubble wasn't seeing ghosts. It really is producing data that allow for an accurate calculation of the Hubble constant of the current universe. So, what's wrong with the theory? Well, if you can answer that, you're light years ahead of the best astrophysicists in the business. It could have something to do with dark energy or dark matter or gravity. 
Maybe we're seeing all of the data fine, but we're somehow wrong about the fundamental nature of C-feed variables. Right now, we just don't know. In other words, James Webb's studies of the Hubble constant show that there's still more to learn. And according to cosmologist Adam Rees of Johns Hopkins University, this is a crack or a surprise that doesn't fit. It's left us more in a kind of confused or purgatory state. The implication is there's a problem with the standard model. You can revise it, but we don't know how to revise it, which direction or in what way. But people shouldn't mistake the tension over the Hubble tension as despair. Instead, it's more of an opportunity to learn something about the universe with the telescopes. As James Webb's observations continue to constrain these crucial cosmological parameters, scientists are trying to fit the data to their best models of how the universe works. Perhaps more precise measurements will solve their problems, or maybe the tensions are just an artifact of something mundane, like quirks of the instruments being used. Or maybe the models are wrong and new ideas, new physics, will be needed. As J. Colin Hill, a theoretical cosmologist at Columbia University said, either we haven't been clever enough to come up with a model that actually fits everything, or there may be, in fact, multiple pieces of new physics at play. What might they be? Perhaps a new fundamental force field, Hill said, or interactions among dark matter particles that we don't yet understand, or new ingredients that aren't yet part of our description of the universe. Some new physics models tweak dark energy, adding a surge of cosmic acceleration in the early moments of the universe, before electrons and protons glommed onto each other. As Mark Kamiokowski, a cosmologist at Johns Hopkins University said, if the expansion rate could somehow be increased, just a little bit for a little while in the early universe, you can resolve the Hubble tension. Kamienkowski and one of his graduate students proposed the idea in 2016, and two years later, they outlined some signatures that a high-resolution cosmic microwave background telescope should be able to see. And the Atacama Cosmology Telescope, perched on a mountain in Chile, did see some of those signals. But since then, other scientists have shown that the model creates problems with other cosmic measurements. Dragon Hooterer, a theoretical cosmologist at the University of Michigan, pointed out that kind of fine-tuned model, where an additional type of dark energy surges for a moment and then fades out, is too complicated to explain what's happening. And other proposed solutions to the Hubble tension tend to match observations even more poorly. They're hopelessly tuned, like just so stories that are too specific to be in step with the long-held idea that simpler theories tend to win out against complex ones. Data coming in the next year may help. First up will be the results from Friedman's team looking at different probes of the nearby expansion rate. Then in April, researchers will reveal the first data from the largest cosmological sky survey to date, the Dark Energy Spectroscopic Instrument. Later in the year, the Atacama Cosmology Telescope team and researchers making another primordial background map using the South Pole Telescope will likely release their detailed results of the microwave background at higher resolution. Observations on the more distant horizon will come from the European Space Agency's Euclid, a space telescope that launched in July, and the Vera C. Rubin Observatory an all-sky mapping machine being built in Chile that will be fully operational in 2025. The universe might be 13.8 billion years old, but our quest to understand it and our place within it is still in its infancy. Everything in cosmology fit together just 15 years ago in a brief period of tranquility that turned out to be a mirage. The fissures that appeared a decade ago have split wide open creating bigger rifts in cosmology's favorite model. In short, now everything has changed. A stunning new image from James Webb shows a vast star factory located in a neighboring galaxy in vibrant colors and incredible detail. The orange, yellow, and blue image from the powerful space telescope features the interstellar atomic hydrogen of the 1,030 light-year wide Nebula N79 located in the Large Magellanic Cloud, 
a satellite galaxy of the Milky Way. This region is actively forming stars and remains virtually unexplored by astronomers. N79 is considered to be a younger sibling of another recent James Webb target in the Large Magellanic Cloud, the Tarantula Nebula, which lies about 161,000 light-years from Earth. Despite their similarities, scientists think that over the last 500,000 years, N79 has been forming stars at twice the rate of the Tarantula Nebula, officially known as 30 Doradus. Studying regions of intense star birth like N79 with the Webb Telescope allows scientists to learn about the composition of star birthing clouds of gas and dust in the early universe when star formation was at its most intense. The new James Webb image focuses on three giant complexes of cold atomic gas called molecular clouds, which comprise what astronomers call N79 South, or S1. One of the most striking aspects of the image is the starburst pattern that surrounds the bright heart of N79. This effect is created by diffraction spikes caused by the 18 pieces of Webb's primary mirror as they collect light. These mirrors are arranged in a hexagonal pattern like a honeycomb, meaning there are six main diffraction spikes. These diffraction spikes arise when James Webb studies particularly bright and compact objects that have light emerging from a concentrated location. So, when the $10 billion telescope looks at galaxies, even ones that may appear very small, the light comes from more diffuse and spread out sources, meaning the diffraction pattern is absent. James Webb captured the new N79 image using its MIRI. Visible light is readily absorbed by such dense clouds of dust, but long-wave infrared light goes through more easily. So the infrared view of MIRI allows astronomers to peer deep into this star-forming region. As a result, James Webb is also able to see young stellar bodies that are still cocooned in their natal womb of gas and dust. These so-called protostars haven't yet gathered enough material from this envelope to become massive enough to fuse hydrogen to helium in their cores, the process that defines what a star is. An infant star that has just started this process can be seen as the brightest point in the midst of billowing orange clouds of gas and dust in the James Webb's N97 image. Webb's observations of N79 are part of the powerful telescope's mission, which includes examining the evolution of disks and envelopes of material surrounding stars at different stages of their evolution. It is hoped that, as part of this mission, James Webb will help astronomers get their first look at planet-forming disks of material surrounding young stars that resemble the Sun, thus providing them with a picture of how our solar system formed around 4.6 billion years ago. Elsewhere, using the Hubble Space Telescope, astronomers have just discovered that the atmosphere of a relatively small planet outside the solar system is rich with water vapor. Don't plan a vacation to this destination just yet, however. The planet's surface is hot enough to melt lead, meaning it's a steamy world inhospitable to life as we know it. More specifically, the team behind this finding says the extrasolar planet, or exoplanet, named GJ, 9872 D exhibits Venus like temperatures of 752 degrees Fahrenheit or 400 degrees Celsius. But that doesn't make this discovery any less exciting. Though scientists have found water vapor in the atmospheres of many extrasolar planets before, the Hubble telescope's observations of this hot and steamy world, designated GJ9827D, represent the smallest exoplanet around which this vital element for life has been found thus far. As Laura Kreidberg, team member and director of the Max Planck Institute for Astronomy's Atmospheric Physics of Exoplanets Department, said, The discovery of water on GJ9827D is exciting because it's the smallest planet yet where we've detected an atmosphere. It pushes closer than ever to characterizing truly Earth-like worlds. GJ9827D is around twice as wide as Earth and orbits a star called GJ987, 
which is located around 97 light years away from us toward the constellation of Pisces. The planet is just one of three Earth-like worlds orbiting this star, which appears to be around 6 billion years old. And according to Bjorn Benecke, team member and a scientist at the Trottier Institute for Research on Exoplanets at Université de Montréal, this would be the first time that we can directly show through atmospheric detection that these planets with water-rich atmospheres can actually exist around other stars. This is an important step toward determining the prevalence and diversity of atmospheres on rocky planets. However, a major question remains. What type of planet is GJ9872D? To be honest, the nature of these small-ish planets, between two and three times the size of Earth, is really uncertain. According to Kreidberg, they could be true super-Earths, with a large rocky core and a light atmosphere on top. Or they could be something completely different, like a water world made predominantly from water ice that has no analog in our own solar system. Hubble observed GJ98270D for three years and watched as the world crossed the face of its star, or transited it, 11 times because chemical elements and compounds absorb light at characteristic wavelengths. As light from a parent star passes through a planet's atmosphere, it carries fingerprints of the elements that comprise the planet itself. Currently, the astronomers behind this discovery aren't certain whether Hubble detected a small amount of water in a puffy hydrogen-rich atmosphere when it examined GJ9872D, or if the planet's atmosphere is predominantly made of water. Either result would be exciting, whether water vapor is dominant or just a tiny species in a hydrogen-dominant atmosphere. Pierre-Alexis Roy, research lead author and a scientist at the Trottier Institute for Research on Exoplanets at Université de Montréal, said in the statement, if GJ9872D has spent its six billion year lifetime close to its parent star, Intense radiation should have boiled away any primordial hydrogen present, leaving the tiny planet with an atmosphere dominated by water vapor. This seems to be supported by the fact that attempts to detect hydrogen around GJ9872D have thus far failed. Alternatively, if GJ9872D is still clinging to a hydrogen-rich envelope laced with water, it would be classified as a mini-Neptune, a type of planet less massive than Neptune, but that still resembles the solar system ice giant in possessing a thick atmosphere of hydrogen and helium. On the other hand, the exoplanet could resemble a larger and hotter version of Jupiter's moon Europa, which is believed to host twice as much water as Earth sealed beneath a thick, icy crust. As Beneke said, the planet GJ9827D could be half water, half rock, and there would be a lot of water vapor on top of some smaller, rocky body. Should GJ9827D still possess a thick atmosphere of water vapor, this would imply that it was born further out from its star, where temperatures would have been lower, before migrating to the position we see today. This migration would have resulted in the exoplanet being blasted with more radiation from its host star, transforming potential ice on GJ9827D into liquid water and water vapor. Any present hydrogen would have gotten heated, eventually beginning to leak from the planet's atmosphere due to the world's relatively low gravity. This leaking could still be occurring while astronomers observe the exoplanet today. Beneke added, until now, we had not been able to detect the atmosphere of such a small planet directly and we're slowly getting in this regime now. At some point, as we study smaller planets, there must be a transition where there's no more hydrogen on these small worlds, and they have atmospheres more like Venus, which is dominated by carbon dioxide. The study of GJ9827D with Hubble has marked the planet as a prime target for a follow-up investigation conducted with the James Webb Space Telescope. This work is already underway, with the $10 billion telescope capable of delivering more details about this potential water world. As Kreidberg concluded, GJ9827D 
is being observed with James Webb to learn more about its atmospheric composition and search for additional molecules like carbon dioxide. Observations are ongoing and we'll have more answers soon. Hopefully we can now settle the question of water worlds once and for all. That's all the information that we have for you today. Don't forget to give us a thumbs up if you enjoyed today's episode, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell so you never miss out on future episodes. And be sure to also tell us what you think about today's content. Everyone's support motivates us to continue delivering quality content and to always improve. As always, thanks for watching and we will see you next time.